So in this last session uh, for today, I'm going to talk to you about a, a kind of a new approach to thinking about cognitive modeling, and that's using quantum probability theory to construct models of reasoning, and in particular, in this case, models of causal reasoning. So causal reasoning, you do it every day. Um, sometimes it's, it's um, so aut almost automatic, you don't even think about it. If you want a cup of tea, you know that you've got to plug the kettle in and push the button to make the water boil um, because you know that turning it on will cause the water to boil if there's water in it. Sometimes causal reasoning is a lot more complicated. So you walk outside to the garage and your car won't start and you have to try to reason about what are all the different things that might have gone wrong. And so maybe your kind of reasoning might resemble this network here where all, you have all of these different possibilities such as no oil, no gas, starter broken, that could cause the car not to start. So causal reasoning is pretty pervasive throughout our everyday lives. Um, and we're actually pretty good at doing causal reasoning, and there's a lot of evidence for this. So, for example, kids are good at figuring out causal gadgets. Uh, so this is work by Alison Gopnik, um, showing that kids can use, figure out um, blicket detectors. People are also pretty good about learning uh, causal relationships through observation and also reasoning from contingency tables. So if I tell you that um, there's some chemical that can cause DNA mutations in a mouse, um, I could either teach you, you know, the, the relationships between these over trials through observation, or maybe I give it to you in some table like this, and people are pretty good about reasoning about all of these things. However, there's a growing body of uh, research that shows that sometimes our reasoning is less good. So sometimes our reasoning is what we'd say is at odds with uh, classical probability theory or Bayesian accounts of reasoning. So one piece of evidence for this uh, is violations of the causal Markov property. So causal Markov property is a, a property of causal Bayes nets, so our classical probability models of causal reasoning. So let's say we have the following causal relationship here. So this is a chain relationship where a high amount of ozone can cause low air pressure, which then can cause high humidity. So if I want to know if the humidity is low or high, this is the question I'm trying to decide, and I know the air pressure is low, then it doesn't matter what the value of the ozone is um, because essentially, because I know air pressure here is low, it sort of screens off and makes this variable irrelevant in some sense. So the Markov property says that in this case, ozone has no influence on our knowledge um, about um, humidity when we know air pressure, when we know this intermediate state here. Well, guess what? Um, people don't follow the causal Markov condition in, um, in certain situations. So you get violations of this property. We also see um, something what we call anti-discounting behavior. So to illustrate this, let's consider the following um, uh, causal relationship here. So this is a common effect. So you've got two causes here. So you can have a, a high degree of urbanization can, can cause um, high um, socioeconomic mobility, and then also low interest in religion causes a high um, socioeconomic mobility. So let's suppose that I want to know if interest in religion, is it low? What's the probability of it being low? And suppose I know that socioeconomic mobility is high. So um, essentially I'm asking religion, is, what's the probability of it being low, given that this variable here is high? Well, I can compare this question to one in which I also know the value of urbanization. So maybe there's a high degree of urbanization, and now I want to know what's the probability of a low interest in religion. A normative way to evaluate this problem would just say um, the probability of religion being low is actually greater in this situation when I don't know about urbanization. As soon as I know that urbanization is high, that explains explain why socioeconomic mobility is also high. 
provides a reason for why this variable is high um, in this situation, which we don't have when this is unknown. So discounting would say that interest in religion is more likely to be low when urbanization is unknown. What we find is that people don't obey this relationship. Um, they often judge it the other way around or say that these two uh, questions are essentially um, equal. This is another example um, coming from looking at both predictive and diagnostic reasoning. So let's um, think about this following problem where we have depression causes lethargy. Well, there's lots of things that can cause you to be lethargic besides depression, so there's also a bunch of other unknown causes here. And if I was to ask you what's the probability um, that you are uh, lethargic given that you have depression, um, I, let's call this the predictive fool. So that includes the possibility of all these other unknown causes. But let's also now consider a situation where I've ruled out these other unknown causes. So I'm only asking what's the probability of being lethargic given depression and there's nothing else that, there's no other causes for um, the lethargy. So we might say that predictive fool should be greater than predictive no alternative because here we've got all these extra reasons why someone might be lethargic that we don't have here. Well, we can turn the question around and ask the diagnostic question, which is to ask the probability of the cause given the effect. So I can say, what's the probability someone has depression given that we know that they're lethargic um, plus all these other things down here, these other unknown causes? versus what's the probability they have depression given um, that they are lethargic but none of these other causes are there. And so in this case we might judge the di um, diagnostic no alternative to be greater than the diagnostic fool because in this situation if we know that the person's lethargic and there's no other reason why they should be lethargic then that would suggest that maybe they have depression. What turns out is that people get this one wrong. Um, they tend to judge these two things as being equal, but they're really good at the diagnostic one. So you get these asymmetries in reasoning here where um, for diagnostic reasoning, at least in this particular example, um, people look quote unquote classical or Bayesian, but for predictive they don't. So how do we put all of this together? Um, so we're pretty good at causal reasoning when causal structures are really simple. Um, we can have the opportunity to learn about causal relationships through observation. Or maybe we have statistical information, um, for example, contingency tables. However, we see judgments deviate from normative or classical pre um, prescriptions when st causal structures are more complex or when reason from linguistic descriptions. So all the examples I showed you previously were about little kind of made up vignettes. Um, so these are kind of linguistic stories where people aren't given any statistical information. They don't learn about contingencies over time. Um, and in this kind of class of problems, we end up seeing these deviations from the normative prescriptions. So then the question becomes, how do we combine Bayesian and non-Bayesian influences in a principled way? Because we do see both in causal reasoning. Clearly people are good at it sometimes, but there are clear instances where the Bayesian uh, model um, uh, is violated. Well, one approach has been taken by um, Bob Rader and this group here, um, Ropeman and Hasties, which is to basically say we've got a causal network here, causal Bayes net, and what we can do is we can elaborate that. So we can add extra variables, um, we can add extra links between variables. So these are extra things that have been added which were never mentioned specifically in the problem. So these are things the participants in the study um, imagined um, and postulated existing. And this approach will work. Um, and uh, they've shown that you can, you know, if you, if you add enough variables and extra links in, you can account for a, a wide range of behavior. However, it's, it's a little unsatisfying because usually um, it's a bit post hoc. So it's, you know, you, you run a, an experiment and you say, okay, well, I see a violation of the causal uh, Markov property or I see anti-discounting. Now how can I explain it? Let's go add in a variable. Let's go add in a link. And then that will explain that. It's also difficult to test these theories because 
they're assuming that participants are imagining things that are not actually explicitly mentioned in the problem. So what I'm going to talk to you today is about an alternative, and that's to use um, what we call quantum probability theory to build a modeling framework for causal reasoning. All right, so before I get into that kind of modeling framework for causal reasoning, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how quantum probability theory works. So the first thing is, how are events represented? Um, so as many of you are probably aware, uh, we are in the middle of a big primary back in the States. Um, so is Hillary Clinton trustworthy? This is a very important question right now. So a classical sample space would look something like this, um, assuming that it's a yes-no um, answer. So Clinton is either trustworthy worthy yes or she's not no. Well, we can actually represent these two um, events in a geometric way. We can use a vector space and say that the yes event's going to be represented by this vector and the no one by this vector. This means we can draw um, a picture that looks like this. So this is a two-dimensional, very simple representation here. So here's my vector yes, here's my vector no, and they're sitting in a unit circle. All right, so how do I calculate probabilities using this type of representation? So classical probability theory defines a function p that's going to map from subsets of some sp sample space into the interval 0, 1. So let's say, for example, the probability that Clinton is um, trustworthy is 0.4. The probability she's not is 0.6. So now, how do we do this within this geometric framework? Well, quantum probability theory postulates the existence of what we're going to call a state vector, belief state. And this is represented by this um, symbol here, psi. And this is a unit length state vector, which we are then going to use to calculate probabilities. So if I want to know the probability that um, the answer is yes, so that she's trustworthy, what I do is I project or I lay down my state vector onto the yes subspace here. The subspace is very simple. It's just a ray. It's one dimensional. And I'm going to take the length of that projection, and that's going to determine um, my probability. Um, so technically, this length is called something the probability amplitude. You can kind of think about it as like pre-probability. Um, so it's, in this particular example, it might be, the length might be 0.63. The entire length of this thing is 1. And then to get a probability, um, I apply Born's rule. So there's a theorem that tells me how to do this. And essentially what I do is I take this projection, this length, and I'm going to square it. And if I do that, I get 0.4. So I can exactly replicate what I did in the classical uh, model. If I now wanted to ask what's the probability that the answer is no, that she's not trustworthy, this time I'm going to project in the other direction onto the no subspace. And I'm going to take the length of this thing again. Let's say it's 0.77 here. And I'm going to again apply Born's rule, and that will give me the probability, in this case 0.6, so it matches the classical probability. So I set this thing up so it would be identical to the classical model. So I'm showing you how you can embed the classical model within this kind of quantum framework. This is going to be really important for what I'm going to talk about in a second because essentially I'm going to have um, a hierarchy of different models from completely quantum to completely classical all within the same framework. So being able to put the classical model in the same kind of uh, mathematical description as, as the quantum models is really important. So that was a very simple example involving one event, Clinton being trustworthy or not. But of course, in this election, there are two people um, that we care about. We care about Clinton and we care about Trump. So let's say I ask you a question. I say, is Clinton trustworthy? You say yes, no. And then I say, how about Donald Trump? Is he trustworthy? And so you say yes or no. So our classical sample space for this could look something like this. I've got Clinton yes, Trump yes, Clinton yes, Trump no, Clinton no, Trump yes. Clinton no, Trump no. So these are my four elementary joint events. Well, I can map them into my geometric framework. So um, the first event, I'm going to map it into this vector. The next one, 
so forth. So I have a four-dimensional space here. And this allows me to represent these two binary variables. That's one way of representing these two variables. And this is, will turn out to be kind of the classical way of doing it. The alternative, and for um, simplicity, what we can say the quantum way of doing it, is a little bit different. What we're going to say is that there's, we've got the Clinton events over here. We've got the Trump events over here. So Clinton, yes, no, Trump, yes, no. I've got a space, a two-dimensional space to represent Clinton. I've got a two-dimensional space to represent Trump. And I'm going to paste them together. So essentially what I've done is within the same two-dimensional framework, I'm representing both events. There's um, a, a really important implication of this. The implication is the joint events do not exist anymore. So what we don't have in this representation are things like Clinton, yes, Trump, yes. So that joint event, that elementary joint event that we have in the classical model. Um, so we've broken that. Um, we can still calculate questions about and, um, but it's a little bit different. So just to quickly summarize, quantum, this kind of quantum um, framework allows for two different ways of representing events. This way here um, is, is got the name compatible. So compatible, when you hear that, you should also think classical. And that's where we have all of the elementary joint events. And we can associate each one of those with a dimension in some high dimensional um, vector or Hilbert space. An incompatible representation means there are no joint events, and I can use a lower dimensional space. So for this very simple problem, I can use a two dimensional space. So I have to make a decision about what is the representation that I want to use in this particular problem. Do I want to use compatible or do I want to use incompatible? Let's say I decide I want to use the incompatible representation. Well, I might want to ask questions about joint events, because I can ask people questions about conjunctions. And so how do I model that? And it's done the following way. So again, I have a state vector sitting in my space here. And let's say I want to calculate, we'll call this the quantum probability of um, Clinton yes and Trump no. The critical part here is that I have to specify a projection order. Um, so I have to do one of these things and then the other. So when events are incompatible, it means that they're processed sequentially. Um, and so really, the and question is the and then question. So in this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to project my state down onto Clinton yes first. And that gives me a new state I updated. So I'm now sitting here. My state is short because I've projected down. And then I'm going to project up to Clinton no, at which point I'm going to take the length, I'm going to square it, and that will give me the probability. Now let's suppose that I turn this around. So I first ask about Trump, then I ask about Clinton. So in this case, I'm going to project onto, let's say, Trump no, and then from there, I'm going to project down onto Clinton, yes. And then I take the length, I square it, and I get the probability. What you notice is that these two things will give you different end results. So we have this non-commutative property here. So the probability of Clinton, yes, Trump, no, is not the same as Clinton, no, uh, or sorry, Trump, no, Clinton, yes. Um, so quantum probability theory, when we use incompatible events, we naturally get non-commutativity, which leads to things like order effects. So those were joint probabilities. What about conditional probabilities? We can calculate those too. So let's suppose um, we've got following problems. So um, the prob we want to know the probability of a defendant being guilty given by the variable G, given the defense's case D is strong. So here is my very simple um, presentation of this problem. So I have guilty no in red and guilty yes here. And let's, um, here is my defense. Let's say it's weak and strong. I've got a state sitting in here. The first thing I do, um, because I know um, the defense is strong. So this is the information that I know to be true. 
I'm going to project down onto defenses strong, and then I'm going to do something special. I'm going to normalize the state vector. And essentially this means I'm setting the probability of the defense strong to one, which is what we would essentially do in the classical model as well. We're saying we know this to be true, so the probability is one. That's all I'm doing here. And then I'm going to project back onto guilty yes. And that will give me the probability. And if I wanted to write it out in math, it would look like this. All right, so that was a very quick kind of induction into quantum probability theory. A few comments. First, quantum models can be high dimensional. They are not just 2D models. I can only draw you 2D pictures um, for the most part, so I keep it really simple for these toy examples. Um, Quantum models can use complex vector spaces. Technically, they use Hilbert spaces. I've showed you everything using real numbers. So these models can be high dimensional um, complex vector spaces. Quantum models can have mixtures of incompatible and compatible events. And this is really crucial. It's not we have necessarily that we have to pick one or the other. It could be the case that some events are compatible, some are incompatible. And we're going to leverage this last property here in what I'm going to show you next. So we wanted to use this quantum probability theory to build up a framework for causal reasoning. And the way we're going to do it is by constructing representations using compatible and incompatible events. So let's consider the um, simple problem here. You've got some variable x, some variable y, and they can cause z. So you have a common effect here. The idea is that perhaps people use different mental representations in different situations. Maybe if someone doesn't have a lot of knowledge about something, or maybe they're lazy and they don't want to think very hard, um, maybe they just, um, each of these variables is incompatible. They only can think about one at a time. So there are no joint events exist. So think about x, then think about y, think about z, and then go back and forth between these. It could be the case that pairs of variables are compatible. So maybe you learn the causal relationship between x and z, and you can form that joint event, and you can form the one for y and z, but you don't have kind of a full representation of the entire graph. And then it could be the case that you do have a full representation. You can represent um, all three variables uh, and form the joint elementary events. And in this case, you would be fully compatible. So this actually gives us a hierarchy of models from fully incompatible. And in our case, this is going to turn into a two-dimensional model because these are binary variables that we'll be working with in our experiment. And we have three of them. We can get four-dimensional representations. This is when you've got pairs of events that are compatible. And then finally, if you've got the full um, compatible representations where you represent everything, we can actually sort of put these on almost a continuum and say this is what we can say is fully quantum. Over here we can say this is fully classical. And I'm using those words to um, mean that this is fully incompatible and this is fully compatible. And this is some mix in here. Well, quantum models, in particular um, uh, models with all incompatible events, make certain interesting predictions. One that I already mentioned is order effects. So let's suppose that you want to know the probability that Mary weighs less at, um, next month. And you know that she's been exercising really hard. Well, I might give you this information. And then I might say, well, you also know that Mary made no changes to her diet and wasn't that great to begin with. So. Um, so now you've got a kind of a positive piece of information and a negative piece of information to her losing weight. Well, I could have presented this information the other way around. I could have said, OK, suppose you know she doesn't make any changes to her diet. Most probably she loses weight. Now you learn she also started this new exercise program. Please update your probability. And you can imagine that in some situations, these two things may not be equal. So if you give people information about her losing uh, uh, her exercising before her diet versus diet the other way around. So diet first and then exercising. You can get different judgments. Under a classical model, these should be the same. So the quantum model predicts order effects. The very simplest model 
um, with two dimensions predicts something called reciprocity. Um, in the judgment decision making literature, this is often called the inverse fallacy. Uh, so it's when the probability of an effect um, given a cause is the same as the probability of the cause given the effect. So it would be, um, for example, that I ask you the probability that she lays, um, Mary weighs less given that she exercised hard, you would judge that the same as the probability she exercises hard given that she weighs less. Another is the mealless property. Again, this is kind of a special property of a, um, the fully incompatible two-dimensional model. Um, so in this case, suppose I say, okay, we want to know about her weighing less, and uh, you know she exercises hard, and I tell you that first. And then I say, okay, she also didn't make any changes to her diet, and you update your probability. Well, the memory list property says that would be the same as if I only told you she um, didn't change her diet and ask you about the probability of her um, weighing less. So it's like that, that variable x had no influence. So this is the memory list property. Again, this is something that um, this simple incompatible model predicts. So this is a summary of the models I'm going to talk about today. If we look at it this way, it goes from fully quantum at the top to fully classical at the bottom. Um, this column here is telling you which events in the model are incompatible. So the first model I have here is uh, the very simplest two-dimensional fully incompatible model. It predicts all order effects and it predicts a whole bunch of other things. Reciprocity, memory lists, it gets Markov violations, anti-discounting, and asymmetries in predictive and diagnostic judgments. Well, it turns out that the reciprocity and memory list properties are properties of the fact that we have one-dimensional rays or one-dimensional subspaces in the two-dimensional model. That's actually distinct from the property of being in, having incompatible events. And so we in, included a model here that's fully incompatible but breaks reciprocity and memorylessness. This is uses instead of a projection something called um, a POVM, a positive operator value measure. And um, essentially what you need to know is that this is an effective way of essentially making this a higher dimensional fully incompatible model. So there's a theorem out of physics that says that a POVM on a lower dimensional space is equivalent to a projector on a high dimensional space. So what this model does is it allows us to have full incompatibility, get all the order effects, not necessarily get reciprocity and memoryless. Um, we can get Markov regulations, anti-discounting, and not necessarily these asymmetries. We have um, four-dimensional models. These are kind of mixed compatible, incompatible models. Um, we have two of them. So the first one um, treats X and Y as incompatible. The second one um, treats E and X as incompatible and E and Y incompatible. So this one, the top one here, we have incompatible causes. Here the causes are compatible. There are other ways to um, construct four-dimensional models, but none of them really make sense for the experiments I'm going to talk about today, so I did not include those here. Um, finally, uh, we have the eight-dimensional model, which is our fully compatible, is our fully quantum, or fully classical model. Um, so in total, we've got uh, five models up here that we're going to be looking at um, that are all related to each other within this framework. So if we go up the hierarchy, all what we're doing is changing assumptions of compatibility, or is changing assumptions about the joint events that people can represent. So our first experiment, we were interested in examining sort of these three special predictions of um, quantum probability theory. One, order effects, reciprocity, and then this memorylessness um, property. And we used a paradigm where we asked participants to reason from vignettes or kind of linguistic descriptions of events, so we didn't give them statistical information. We didn't learn um, the relationships between causes and effects over time. So we borrowed this paradigm from um, Bob Rader. Um, and in this paradigm, we have two causes, x and y, that could cause an, uh, um, uh, an effect E. So the variable x is described as um, an ACH neurotransmitter. It's about this novel animal, for example, a lake shrimp. So we tell participants that a high amount of 
ACH neurotransmitter causes a high body weight, and a low amount of ACH causes a low body weight. And our Y variable, we say an accelerated sleep cycle causes a high body weight, and a normal sleep cycle causes a low body weight. So we teach them this um, novel animal, the shrimp, and its features and how they're related to each other. And after they've learned that and they've answered enough questions to ensure us that they've actually read this and learned this, we ask them to make um, choices about the features of animals. So um, this is an example order effect trial. So um, we tell them a biologist catches a new shrimp in Lake Victoria. The biologist runs a lab test and learns that the shrimp has an accelerated sleep cycle. What type of body weight do you think the shrimp has? And they can say low, equally likely to be high or low, or high. And then we say thank you, and we now run a second lab test on the exact same shrimp. And we say this test shows that the shrimp has a low amount of ACH neurotransmitter, and then we ask them again about the body weight of the same shrimp. Is it low, equally likely, or high body weight? So they have all the information from the first test on the screen when they're answering the question about the second test. And so we have lots of trials. Some of them test order effects, some test reciprocity, some test memorylessness. Um, so in this experiment, we have two blocks of trials. There's 13 questions, so there's lots of comparisons that can be made. We, there are four comparisons that look at order effects. We've got another four looking at reciprocity, then eight looking at memorylessness. Um, I'm not going to show you all of that because it's a lot, but I'm going to just kind of um, cherry pick some representative comparisons here. Um, so we did the statistics here using um, Bayesian statistics, so I'm showing you Bayes factors. If you're not familiar with Bayes factors, they're actually quite easy to interpret. Um, Bayes factor greater than one means that there's a difference here. If it's really large, then the difference is pretty substantial. If it's less than one, there's no difference. If it's really small, that means there's a lot of evidence for there not being much difference. If it sits between, let's say, 0.33 and 3, it's generally considered inconclusive because it's right there, right around 1, so it's not um, much evidence. So in general, bigger or smaller is better with Bayes factors. If we look at order effects, what we see is that when we have a situation where um, the causes match. So here X1 and Y1 um, essentially are both indicators of high body weight, so they both point to the same thing. You don't get an order effect. Uh, we get kind of floor and ceiling effects in our data. Um, so this is not surprising. However, when they mismatch, so you get sort of positive versus negative evidence, you get very large order effects. You get large Bayes factors. We get kind of weak-ish evidence for reciprocity. So reciprocity is an, um, uh, an invariance. So evidence for reciprocity is actually going to be a little tiny base factor. So it should be less than one, because they should be equal if reciprocity holds. They're less than one, but they're very close to fitting into this inconclusive range. So we get some weak evidence that maybe there's reciprocity. And then the memorylessness evidence is just all over the place. So in this case, we get some evidence for it, we get strong evidence against memorylessness. So, okay, um, I wanted to see what our modeling results would, would tell us, um, because the behavior results are kind of mixed. Um, we see some evidence for kind of these fully incompatible representations, but some evidence for not. Well, we fit all five models. We used um, Bayesian statistical methods to fit the models um, to the group data here. And um, we calculated a DIC. So DIC is kind of similar to a BIC, if you're familiar with that, but for Bayesian um, uh, uh, models. And uh, smaller is better here, um, so more negative. And we can see that the 2D POVM, so this is the two-dimensional model um, that uses this special operator that allows it to effectively be high-dimensional, fully incompatible. And then we get a four-dimensional um, compatible causes, turns out to be the best. If you're curious of what the model fits look like, so here red dots are data group averages. And then the black um, kind of spread out squares, those are the posterior predictives. So we want most of the mass of the, the <coughs> prediction from the model, so the black squares to be sitting on top of the dots. In a lot of cases, they do. There's some misses, but overall, it looks, looks all right.
So the modeling results suggest that um, we, we have some form of these sort of intermediate representations that are happening in this um, um, uh, first experiment. But I would say that these results are really inconclusive. Uh, so we have evidence of presence of non-classical effects. We've got pretty good evidence of order effects, especially when, um, when you've got positive versus negative kind of information. Reciprocity is pretty weak, and memoryless is just a mixed bag of stuff. So we've got the 2D POVM. We've got this four-dimensional model. They're the ones that are preferred when we do model comparisons. We really, it's hard to distinguish between these two models. The um, DICs are pretty close. Um, so we're kind of left without, you know, really strong conclusions after this first experiment. And one of the things we thought was maybe this mixture of representations might result from individual differences. So maybe different people use different representations and when we average over all the data and we're trying to fit it, we get these sort of mixed looking results. So we wanted to try to address this in experiment two. So this experiment looks at individual differences. In particular, we're looking at reciprocity, memorylessness. We look at mark violations and anti-discounting. Um, exact same as experiment one, except people gave judgments instead of making choice. Um, we allowed them to give a judgment between zero and 100. This means that we can model individuals instead of um, uh, groups. Okay, so in this experiment, there were 14 judgment questions. They were broken down. We have four comparisons for reciprocity, four for memoryless, two for Markov violations, and two for anti-discounting. Again, sort of cherry-picked them um, to show you because there's just too many. Um, we're also, again, using Bayes factor. So reciprocity, we get, um, again, uh, evidence for reciprocity because we're looking for a really small Bayes factor here for the invariance. It's a little bit better than the previous one, but it's still, it's still kind of weak. Memorylessness, this time we're seeing more evidence for memorylessness in this particular task, and we're getting less sort of mixed results. We get very strong evidence of Markov violations. So here, a Markov violation would be a very large Bayes factor, because we would judge these things as being, being different. I think there's a typo there. but. Um, and then finally, anti-discounting. Here, what we're finding is that people judge the probabilities in these questions as to be roughly the same. So that's what the little tiny Bayes factor means, which would be evidence of, um, of anti-discounting in the sense that they're not discounting um, properly, so they just equate these things. So again, we're getting results that are suggestive of kind of non-classical um, reasoning. So we fit the models to the data, and this is what we found. So we've got, we decided to focus on the 2D POVM, the four-dimensional um, one that we preferred in experiment one, and then also the eight-dimensional, because that's the classical one. That actually turns out 40% of our people look classical, but the rest of the folks, the other 60, are some um, other form, some um, uh, representation here. So we've got 34 people in this sort of mixed um, representation and then 26 that are this fully compatible but in this kind of higher dimensional space. So we thought that's nice, but it would be nice to see that the people that we grouped in this way, basically by looking at DIC, which, you know, which was the smallest DIC, this is how we sorted people, if this actually makes sense when we go back and look at behavioral results. Uh, so what we did is we calculated for each of those four effects we were interested in, we calculated essentially a score for those. So it's a basically the average reciprocity, reciprocity um, value here, so how large was reciprocity, so again, just kind of looking at the difference between the, the two um, judgments to compare reciprocity. Um, so what we find is that people that were fit best by the 2D POVM tend to have smaller reciprocity scores. That's what we would expect because um, reciprocity, um, is the, the score would be smaller, the more reciprocity. So again, reciprocity is um, invariant, so a zero would be um, full reciprocity. We see, uh, oh, we see um, here, we did the same thing for memory lists. We kind of get a mixed picture, but in general, we see you know, that the 4D people show less memory listness. The 2D, not quite sure what's going on with these classical folks here. 
Um, with Markov score, we get the right direction where larger Markov violations are the fully incompatible, fewer for the fully compatible. Anti-discounting is the largest for this fully incompatible group. So the effects, the, the grouping that we did in this kind of manner of just looking at DICs seems to kind of map on to the ideas of what kind of the behavioral signatures we should see for these groups. We also wanted um, to just look at how well the model fits the data. So this is all the participants' judgments for every question that they were asked um, up here. And they're color coded by different types of questions. Um, what you can see is there's no clear winner here in terms of how well the model fits the data. I mean, they all kind of have um, misfit in some ways. So these kind of systematically underestimate and over um, large probabilities and underestimate um, uh, or overestimate small ones, similar here. But they're doing a reasonable job capturing um, the trend in the data. So we think there are large individual differences in the representations that participants use. Um, some participants are in agreement with the classical representation, but most, to 60%, are not. So then this led us to say, OK, what are the factors that drive these individual differences? Why do some people seem more classical than others? And that was um, our next experiment. So in this experiment, we're interested in examining two factors that might determine the form of the representation. One is familiarity with the reasoning domain. Um, so we give them this kind of novel made up animal. And you know, we, we tell them about the features, and they have to remember those. But um, they, in the previous experiments, they didn't have a lot of opportunity to um, gain familiarity with the task in terms of the judgment task of um, answering questions multiple times. We were also wondering if something like thinking style might be related to this, so um, more intuitive versus more deliberative thinking style. So this um, experiment looks at order effects, reciprocity, memorylessness, and Markov violations. It's exactly the same as the other ones, except participants. We have them do multiple blocks in order to test for this familiarity. So to manipulate uh, familiarity, we had nine questions in two alternating blocks. So we had a block X and a block Y. Here are the questions. We then did three repetitions of each block. So they do X, Y, X, Y, X, Y. We then, at the end of the um, experiment, gave them the cognitive reflection test. It's a very simple test, which assesses individuals' ability to suppress an intuitive, or what we could say system one wrong answer, in favor of a deliberative or more system um, two correct answer. So here's an example of a question on the CRT. Um, a bat and a ball cost a dollar ten in total. The bat cost a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Well, if you don't think very hard, the quick wrong answer is 10 cents. If you think about this for a little bit, the correct answer is 5 cents. So the CRT, or Cognitive Reflection Test, is very simple. It's only got three questions on it. Um, this is one of them. And so it's very quick and easy to administer. And there's been a number of um, published papers that have shown that the CRT is related to all sorts of different types of behavior and judgment decision making, so risk taking, um, uh, different sorts of heuristics and biases. So we thought, why not? Let's try it here and see what happens. Um, so I'm going to show you the behavioral results grouped by CRT. Uh, we had six people in this task, and we ended up with a bunch of people with CRT scores of zero, so they got everything wrong, a bunch of people that got a score of three, so they got it all right, and then the other kind of middle scores were split. Uh, we had fewer people in each of those, so we combined them into kind of one middle group. Um, so these are the people that scored one or two. Um, so here's what we're looking at. We've calculated an order score, a reciprocity score, a memorylessness score, and a Markov score based on the questions in the task. So I'm going to look at the top panel up here, the order score first. What I want to point out is that the high group, the deliberative folks, have very low order effect scores as compared to the other people, which is what we might expect. So those people that were 
tried a bit hard, so, um, the deliberative folks, so they tried harder in the CRT, are also the people that didn't produce as many order effects in our task. What's also interesting is the order effects decrease across block pairs. So everybody, even these folks up here, they get better um, with familiarity or with experience. If we look over here at reciprocity, what we see is in this very low group, they get significantly better with um, over trials, um, block pairs. So they start off showing more reciprocity and by the end they show less reciprocity. And the other two groups seem to be pretty stable at not showing much reciprocity. If we look down here at memorylessness, um, our high group is not showing as much memorylessness as our lower group, our, our low and medium groups. So these folks down here are the ones that show this kind of special property of memorylessness. And then finally, Markov violations. Um, you see the largest Markov violations for the low CRT group, but they tend to get better over um, time. So these behavioral results are sort of um, uh, indicative of, of what we were hoping to find, which was that you know, um, cognitive thinking style would separate people out and familiarity would um, potentially help um, everybody uh, look more classical in this task. But we wanted to look at this with models as well. So we fit three models, the 2D POVM, the 4D model, and then the 8D model here. And what we found is for the low CRT group, the, um, the 2D model, so that's the one circled in red, um, performed the best in the first block pairs and then it fit worse and worse over the other blocks and the other models fit better and better. So this, I think it might be cut off on the screen, but this is the DIC, so lower DIC is better model fit. So 2D model gets worse across time, 4D and 8D models fit better across time. For the medium group, it stays kind of flat, actually. Um, we still see the 2D model is slightly preferred, um, but we don't see much improvement with them. Don't quite know why, but we do see sort of the right direction here for the high CRT group. So the preferred models are the, um, are the 4D uh, uh, and the, or the 8D here, and then the 4D does all right as well. The 2D model doesn't do as well, and especially by the end of the task, it's much worse than the um, uh, uh, fully compatible model. So the modeling results um, um, uh, kind of are indicative of what we expected. So the kind of low CRT group looks more quantum, and it becomes more classical over time. High CRT group looks classical pretty much throughout. Uh, just if you were curious, these are um, fits of the models to the data. Again, the red dots are um, um, the data, and then the posteriors are given in black. These are just examples, so I've ordered the questions um, here from kind of smallest probability to largest. So this is the 2D POVM model for the low CRT group in the first couple of blocks. This is the 4D model with the high CRT group in the last block. This is the 8D model with the high CRT group in the last block as well. And you can see that the model, um, models are doing a pretty good job of capturing um, the data in these situations. So the conclusions from this experiment are that participants' choices appear to change with familiarity. Um, and those participants that display those non-classical effects tend to score lower on this cognitive reflection test. Um, so, at the end, we're sort of left with a, a mixed message. So the take-home message that I want to give you is that reasoning about causal relations is really neither inherently Bayesian or quantum, um, but is rather tied to the representation of events constructed by a particular reasoner. And so that if we want to really understand causal reasoning, we need to be looking at individual differences, and we need to be examining um, different tasks, because in certain tasks, Maybe you gain familiarity or you have prior knowledge you bring to bear. You might look more classical than in some task which is completely novel. You don't have much time to practice. So I want to acknowledge my collaborators, um, so Emmanuel Pothos, postdoc James Yearsley, and grad student Percy for all of their um, help and assaf.
If you are curious about learning more about quantum cognition, I've got some resources on my website. Jerome Bossemeyer also has some resources on his website, and he also wrote a whole book on this. Um, so with that, I just want to thank you, and uh, if you have any questions. That's a very good question. Um, so the state vector uh, in this model, we it's a free parameter. Um, so in the um, in the examples that I showed, just the toy examples about Clinton and Trump, I just picked something. Um, but in in the actual models, when we fit them, we fit the state vector uh, to the data. Proposition of the two um, 